is just so wonderful to see you all here. And initially, the thing I want to do is thank Lisa West. It's an honor to have you here today. It really is. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> and she has done an enormous amount of research on the history of Hadley and on what the beautiful quilt depicts. What we're thinking is that we would like to have this archived because in 20 or 30 or 50 years, we're gonna be in the same place we are today, which is the folks who made the quilt are often no longer with us. So we don't know what it means. So hopefully our conversation today <laughs> will provide something for the next generation. The other thing Lisa and I want you to know is that we would welcome your input. Hadley is a fabulous community. You all have pieces of the puzzle. And Lisa, who's done so much research, knows how many holes there are <laughs> in the puzzle, how many pieces are already lost even, right? So we'd like to start today by talking about how the quilt came about. And Lisa, can I turn it to you at that moment <laughs> to talk about that? Well, we're still missing a few pieces on that. So again, we'd love any input that anybody has. And I think I'd like to start by thanking a group of people. I contacted a lot of people, well, and I, want to be, I just want to give a shout out and thank you to Brenda Tudrin, Mary Fair, Sandy Montgomery Elder, Marge Townsend, Diana West, Terry and Gordon Smith, Betty Faulkner, Estelle Doherty, Glenn Clark, and Cindy Borowski, Irene Hynoski, Jane Wagenbach Booth, and Ginger Dick Kevitz. All of those <laughs> were involved in helping me research the quilt itself. So you guys know that by the time this quilt was made, Hadley was already 317 years old. But the United States was honoring 200 years of being a country independent from Great Britain or England, right? And so all across the country, no matter where you lived at that time, you were probably involved in some sort of a bicentennial celebration. There was curriculum and there was everybody getting stuff together. So Hadley appointed a committee that it consisted of a top, it was a tiered committee, but the top dogs, so to speak, were Margaret Dwyer, Frank Zaylot, and Evelyn Hahn. And from there, there were subcommittees, the churches and the other organizations in town all did something, if not more than one something. The um, Lions Club held a ball in costume. I don't know if any of you were there. Um, they held a ball in costume at um, the university, the Student Union Ballroom. And this book was produced at the time, and it has some neat pictures in it. One is Ed and Joyce Putnam dancing in their costumes. Um, the, the Farm Museum, the Historical Society, the Port of Phelps Huntington House, all had special events and displays. Of course, there was a parade, but that was in Northampton so that all of Hampshire County came together. But Hadley was well represented with the Hopkins Band and other units in the parade. All the different churches had special services. First Church was the oldest church, of course, and started with a special ecumenical worship service. And then Holy Rosary, at the time called Holy Rosary, um, finished up with a worship service. So that the Bicentennial was a big deal. And the Council on Aging existed as earlier than 1976. But in 1976, Irene Clark and Lee Kata or Lillian de Kevitz and Helen Benas were members of the Council on Aging along with some gentlemen. And apparently Irene Clark got the idea that something like this should exist to commemorate the event. And from what the people that I read off to you earlier told me, she handed out these squares with the pictures already drawn on them to her friends and neighbors and said, please embroider this. Then she put it all together and you can't see from where you're sitting, but later you can look closely at it. In between the, the bluish bars that frame each square, it's embroidered with an H. Right? It's quilted with an H, I should say. And of course, that's, that's for Hadley. But that was clever of her to think. Instead of just quilting, quilting, she made, specifically made H's. So of the people that we know, and there's still some mysteries as to who made some of these squares, um, but we do know 
that Irene Park, as I mentioned, Leocadia Dekevitz, Teofilia Janulovich, Miriam Pratt, Fern Nutter, Eleanor Smith, Rita Bishko, Joan Turner, and Elizabeth Southard made squares. They have all passed. But still living are Brenda Tudrin, Estelle Doherty, Cindy Weinzik Borowski, Irene Borowski Hynoski, and um, I did also talked to Midge Pratt's daughter, Marjorie, who remembered her mother sending her letters describing all the events that were going on around the time of the bicentennial. So, um, Irene has been described to me, and I, and I have a clown friend, thanks to Betty. Irene was a big, 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 big crafter. <laughs> and she, according to several of the people I interviewed, she made beautiful children's books, educational books that had like buttons and zippers and things you could braid so the children could learn those things. Yeah, you are. She, had <laughs> she had worked in her early life as an administrative assistant to <clears throat> doctors in a psychiatric hospital. And apparently she told some very entertaining stories about that work that she did. She liked to play the organ, she liked to do her yard work, and she um, apparently was still shoveling snow right into her 90s. She was born in 1910 and died in 2012. Do the math, she was 102 when she passed. Uh, her basement apparently was totally organized with craft stuff all labeled so that she could go right to it and do it. She was a big saver and the really um, entertaining story that one person told me was that she had a pet named Petey, and Petey was a bird with a nest in her living room. <laughs> so Irene was a go-getter here as well in the senior center, and she was really pleased when the Historical Society turned the quilt back to the Council on Aging and so that it could be displayed here for all of us to enjoy. So there's the history that we have so far on the quilt. We're looking for more information. I think we're going to talk about each square. <laughs> I wondered, uh, one of the things in her notes that Lisa put out was that there was a second quilt in 1959. But so 1959 was the tercentenary of Hadley, Okay. for those of you that were here and remember that. This is a book that was made then. And there were many more events that went on at that time that were specific, of course, to the 300 years of Hadley. Hopefully all of you enjoyed the 350th anniversary of Hadley. Books, books, more books. Jane said they're going to have more of these books available to purchase here. So if you missed it, okay. So if you missed it, you have a chance still to buy that that book. But back in 1959, when I was just being born, um, Hadley celebrated 300 years, and they made a quilt at that time too. And I don't, I haven't asked. I should ask um, Gordon and Terry Smith where that might be. I imagine the Historical Society has it. That was one of my questions. Does anyone know about that second quilt, where it might be? Does anyone remember that it was that it even happened? No? News <laughs> to you, too. Hmm. Okay, no? Okay. Lisa, if you want to go on a hunt, that's one of the mysteries, right? Yeah, right. There's many. Okay. So you ready to take on squares? Sure. Okay. We thought we would start by doing this chronologically. You all know that Hadley was founded in? 1659. 1659, right? 1659. Okay, right there on the seal <laughs> of the quilt. Lisa, is this a moment you might want to just talk about the seal a little bit or? Sure. Okay. I don't know exactly when the seal came into being, and that's a new mystery that I'd like to figure out. But you can see that it features Hopkins Academy, and we could go ahead and talk about Hopkins, Hopkins Academy. There was a gentleman named Edward Hopkins who came to the U.S. and ended up being governor in Connecticut, and he was a big merchant. So he went back and forth between England and Connecticut several times doing his business. And then he ended up back in England. He passed away. But at the time, he was exceptionally rich. He left money to all of his nieces and nephews, all of the people who had worked for him, and he left an endowment for his wife. She lived another 40 years beyond him, but he left an endowment that said that when she passed, his money should be used for educational purposes in the New World. Not in England, but here in the United States somewhere. So because he had lived in Connecticut, he set up um, some trustees which included William Goodwin, who, who was one of our original settlers on 
West Street, of course, was our original town. And so ultimately, when he passed away, several of the trustees he had assigned had passed as well. But William Goodwin and another gentleman set up schools in New Haven, Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut, and Hadley, Massachusetts. And the town was only five years old in 1664. And it was, the students came from miles around to be part of that school. It was well known for a very long time. The building that exists now, I believe, is the fifth one. Uh, several of the buildings burned over time. And when Ted and my husband Tom went to school, it was an old house. Yep. And there was a carriage shed that what we called the old gym for many years. And that's one of the squares that's up there. And that's gone now. But that's Hopkins in a nutshell. And of course, General Hooker is um, one of Hadley's maybe embarrassing claims to fame. Um, <laughs> at the time, he was born on West Street, so if you want to point up to the top, that house is not on West Street, but there's a stone there that marks where it was. It's a beautiful gamble-roofed colonial house that burned in, at the very end of the 1800s, I believe, and was replaced by a newer house. But anyway, he went to Hopkins Academy, he went to West Point, and then, of course, he was commissioned in the military. He served in the Seminole Wars and the Mexican-American War, and was really very good in the beginning and, and distinguished himself quite well. And then he got involved in the Civil War. And he, it's been said that he's known for improving the morale of the soldiers. <laughs> and you're all snickering, so you know the rest of the story, so to speak. But he actually improved, I guess, medical care and the provisions, the, the food. But he did allow ladies to follow the troops. Um, I think they were, they were nursing and cooking and sewing on buttons, but perhaps you think they were doing more than just that. So General Hooker, there is a beautiful, beautiful statue down at the State House of him on his horse. So he got involved. In Boston? In Boston, in Boston. yes. He got involved with the Civil War. He was actually put in command by Lincoln of the troops in, the east, uh, in one section in the east here. But then he got mad at, at what was going on and he quit. But then he thought, they need me, so he came back. And then he quit again. Um, but he did win some of the battles, but not all of the battles. He didn't do too well at, at one point. But anyway, that's good. That's wonderful. he lived here. Okay. So that's the seal. Want to talk about the Native Americans? I think we should uh, talk about what preceded Hadley, how Hadley came to be the town it is. And as you can see, as Lisa points out, a Native American square is on there. Who were the tribes around here, Lisa? And how did the whole acquisition of this okay. land happen? So specifically in Hadley, they were the Nip monks. They were part of the Algonquin nation. And there was John Pynchon, Samuel Chapin, and Eliezer Holyoke were founders of Springfield, and then of course Mr. Holyoke founded Holyoke. But those three gentlemen came up and purchased all the land that is now Northampton, West Hampton, East Hampton, South Hampton, Williamsburg, Catfield, Hadley, and all of our neighbors, Amherst, Sunderland, Granby, South Hadley, etc. Because it was beautiful land and because they were entrepreneurs who knew what they were doing. Um, so they came up and they purchased, and I say purchased because Native Americans didn't understand permanent ownership of anything. They felt that the Great Spirit owned the land and that they were just borrowing it. So they, of course, were very migratory. They raised their crops in the summer, but they moved somewhere else in the winter, wherever the good hunting was, et cetera. So they didn't quite understand that they were what they were really giving up, so to speak, in terms of selling. But they were involved in a lot of conflicts with other tribes amongst the Mohawks and so forth. So they were looking for some protection. So at the beginning, when they bought this land in 1653, it was like, hey, we're, we're OK with this. We're going to be good neighbors, and we're going to um, work together. And, but the natives were smart. In the contract, it says that they reserved the right to hunt, fish, and grow their crops. And primarily, their crops were squash and corn. And they also said that Pynchon was responsible for plowing up 16 acres of where they wanted to plant their corn. And the, so the purchase was 100 fathoms of wampum, which was usually beads or seashells that the Native Americans used as their currency. 
and ten coats, Native Americans really liked British clothing and some other trinkets they, they were interested in, things that they hadn't seen before. So there were seven people that signed the deed, and it's interesting, it's in um, the Cutter, Mary Lou Cutter book, there's a copy of it, and that what they did was sign with little pictures that represented their native name. So there's like a little brook and a stick and some other things that represented the Native Americans. Got more there? Mm -hmm. I'm ready to ask you, one of the things that fascinated me was the necessity when you settled a town, mm -hmm. you needed one thing, right? For that a church, town. a pastor and a church. A pastor and a church. Eventually a church. At first you could, they met in somebody's house. Okay. And of course when they first came, there was nothing, right? They came and slept in their wagons, under their wagons, with whatever tents they put up, et cetera, until yep. they built a sort of a rustic building that was the meeting house. And it was always called a meeting house, not a church. And it was obviously used not just for church purposes, but for all the town business, any reason that the town wanted to get together. They were in the meeting house. So what Sharon is now laser pointing is the third building that the colonists built that represents the First Congregational Church of Hadley. The first two were on the town common, and there's a stone that marks where they were on the north end of the town common. And um, the reason that it's the third one is because they just wanted to modernize and, and be nice, bigger and better kind of thing. So this building, that, in the building that still exists right across the street, so to speak, was built in 1808. The first one was built in, in 1659. So the church as a group of people was gathered in 1659, right? Because the colonists that came here to Hadley disagreed with the way that some of the religious practices were happening down in Connecticut. They kind of disagreed with how baptism and membership were going. And so they, there was some people from Hartford, some people from Wethersfield, and some from Windsor, Connecticut, that banded together and bought, they called it the, the new plantation. They bought what is now Hatfield, Williamsburg, Hadley, North Hadley, of course, Sunderland, Amherst, South Hadley and Granby, and maybe even more on the outskirts of that. Mm -hmm. So that colonists did not see the river as an obstacle. <laughs> we see it as an obstacle maybe because the Coolidge Bridge gets blocked off, but <laughs> they saw it as, as their main thoroughfare for transportation of all kinds of goods and people. So Hadley was specifically here and Hatfield. And so the Hatfield, very near the beginning, after they in danger of Indians, had passed, so to speak, Indian attacks, Hatfield was settled, and they still came across the river all the time on various kinds of boats, and then when the river was frozen, it was actually easier to walk across the ice and come for worship services in the church, which was on West Street, so it was, you know, close going across the river. Uh, so you said the church was the third building. The one the first two? Now. They just decided to tear them down and improve them, or build one next door that well, was bigger and better. So the first two buildings were churches or meeting houses. Meeting houses. There's a picture over in First Church of the very first one. It's kind of a rough, it kind of looks like a barn. <laughs> hey. But it was a, a big enough right. building that the town could all gather in. We were talking about the kinds of buildings a town that's just beginning mm -hmm. are, are going to need. And obviously you're going to need, if you have agriculture and you grow corn, you're going to have to have a mill is that right, That's Lisa? Right. And we have actually a mill on the right. different buildings on here that would have been part of the first. So the corn mill is one, uh, six, or is, is that the corn mill? One, six. Yes. Can't read so it. So it was, it, as she said, it was very important to have, you know, you grow the corn, but then you need to grind it. It needs to become flour. It needs to be usable. One of the things that the hop, so I didn't, I guess I didn't finish on the Hopkins. Hopkins continues to today. Ted, are you still a member of the trustees? No, it was 35 years, so I kind of <laughs> That was long enough? Long enough. So there are still Hopkins Academy yeah. trustees who have funds that exist as invested funds, well invested time after time after time to this day that provide scholarships and accessories for the school. And one of the first things that the trustees did was set up a mill. 
to make them money, which was an interesting concept, but they felt that that was an important way to make money for the school. We also have today the Farm Museum, which I think carries some of the history of the agriculture in this town. The Farm Museum has over 3,000 items. If you've never been there, shame on you, no. <laughs> um, it's open in the summer, it's not open as much as we'd like it to be, but we're hoping that a future program, oh, Sharon, we forgot to say, Oh. This, this today is the tip of the iceberg for future programs for Sharon, for future people for Sharon to interview. In fact, Mary Thayer already agreed to come and do an interview on the history of Hakanah. So everything on this quilt has a story that could be a whole program, I think. So we're just trying to touch on the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, just a, an overview. I'm looking at the agriculture, Lisa. Here That's a whole program. You've got to get a good farmer that knows how things have evolved, different things have been, been the cash crops in Hadley to That's make it I'm successful thinking. for agriculture. We do have the most, the highest number of acres preserved for farm use under the CPA in Massachusetts. And that's something that so we, Hadley residents can take pride in. We have cigar, leaf tobacco, asparagus, onions, Brooms, is that right? Yeah. Oh, Hadley is very famous for its broom corn. Yeah. Ah, okay. That was one of our first industries. And there's a whole display on that at Sturbridge Village. Cucumbers and potatoes, I believe, are on that one. Yeah, missing is actually corn itself, squash, pumpkins, and, and nowadays we've got all kinds of soybeans and other things being grown that are cash crops. So like I said, get a farmer to tell us about that someday. The Farm Museum um, is a fun building. Oh, I know, we're gonna ask the audience. There are at least three buildings on here. I don't know if you can see them that well. Good-sized buildings that have been moved a distance. I know my husband knows, so he can't answer. Who else, does anybody know any of who, which buildings those might be? Oh, the Farm Actually, Museum was moved. The Farm Museum. The Farm Museum was originally the barn at Porter Phelps Huntington House. And the Johnsons arranged with the Huntingtons to use that as the building to be the farm museum. I heard the church was moved. You did. <laughs> yeah. You're right. And that's a really fun story, which we could do today or we could save for another day. If it's a short story, do it today. Uh, you're going to run out of time. Uh, okay, we're going to save it. Producer says no. So the church was moved. And the third one is the John Lyman House, which da is down in the bottom here. That's the first house that was built in the Hockenham section and is where Shell Horwitz and Dinah Friedman live now. It's up on Barstow Lane right behind the store. Okay, what else were we talking about? <laughs> so much. Lisa. I know, so much. Let's move along to uh, a couple of stories actually. Uh, the regicides, which are down here in this corner, the home of the regicides. Give us a backstory on what are the regicides? Why are they here? Okay. Well, that could be a whole program, too. And you yeah. can see here I brought, there's three different books, at least, that have been written on that topic. This is the newest one, written by Jim Freeman, who I think you probably all know. The regicides, the word regicide means king killer, <laughs> literally. They were a group of gentlemen in England that ordered the death of Charles I. But then, when other people got excited about that, they escaped to, three of them at least, escaped to this country, which wasn't a country of course, but escaped. And they started in New Haven, Connecticut, and then they got secreted up the river until two of them, General Goff and General Wally, landed in Hadley. And the pastor at the time, John Russell, and that would have been his house, oh. that would have stood at the corner of the north end of West Street and Russell Street where the Elmwood shops are now. Um, he secreted them for at least 12 years or more. So they either stayed in his attic or his cellar, or there was allegedly a room sort of built behind his chimney, kind of like a closet-sized room. So if you can imagine living in the cellar, the attic, and the room. But there was a price on their heads, General Goff and General Wally. And um, Wally was the father-in-law of Goff. They left behind wives and children in England. I can't imagine what those poor women did for all these years, because they died here eventually. But the story of the angel is that when all the people, and it was required that all the people go to church, worship all day long on Sunday, 
So that was when General Goff and Wally got the chance to go outdoors and breathe some fresh air and not be seen or found. And so allegedly, General Goff was out on a Sunday and he saw that Native Americans had breached the palisades that were built around the town. Remember, the town only exists of West Street at this time. And they were going to attack the church. The people, and the people in the church would have been like sitting ducks, right, all contained within the church. And so he sounded an alarm. In other words, he ran into the church. Apparently, he carried a sword, according to the legend. Um, ran into the church, and he was a general, so he led all the people in the church to fight off the natives. And there are famous pictures, numerous famous pictures, of that. I don't know. If, sorry, John, I didn't warn you about this. But um, you've probably all seen the famous pictures. That's him on the front there, right? But he's bursting into the church, and some of the people in the church have apparently been identified as to who they were. And then they were required to bring their musket to church with them in, just in case there was going to be an Indian attack. He led the attack, thwarted the Indians' attack, and then he disappeared, right, back into the cellar in the attic. Um, there's a lot of politics around that story and a lot of people who were protecting him and his father-in-law. One of the things that I found interesting that you told me was um, what do I get if I come and settle in Hadley? As an original settler, what do, you get, what do I get? You signed the contract, you bought into it, and you got, because they all paid to buy the land from yeah. Pynchon and the others, and you got eight acres of a homestead so that would, Hadley was a settled, a, a planned community. We think that's like a 21st or 20th century concept, right, 20th century. Hadley was a planned community. You had your eight acres that went off the town common. So you know now where the town, town common is with the streets on either side. The land in the middle was for grazing your animals and the church, the church being so important that it was located there. I should call it meeting house. And then you had your eight acres that went back from your house. You also got woodlots and you also got meadow land where you could graze your animals. And of course, woodlot was incredibly important for your firewood that sustained you in your cooking and your heating and everything else. I Could did. I add something to that? I was just sure. I did. I did a little research. Uh, uh, my father, we lived on Mill. Lived on Mill. We live there now. In 1934, he bought the house, and in his uh, deed, which I have here, uh, that says that there was a certain parcel of land in Great Meadow, said Hadley at Grass Hollow, so called and they have the description containing four more acres or less. Now, I did research on that recently and found out that uh, that never, and my dad told me, that doesn't exist anymore, it's in the river. That's all I remember. <laughs> and as, as recently as about three months ago, I, I, something came out and I did a little research, and I found out that it ties into what you just said, uh, that the, uh, in 1659 to 1713, uh, Great Meadows. Now, Great Meadows is off of the, this is a map in 1700. Great Meadows is off of the common of West Street, mm -hmm. which is Honey Pot now, the mm -hmm. cemetery. That was called Green, Green Great Meadows. Meadows. And at the time, what they did is they, they, they took 710 acres divided by 177 lots which averaged four acres. So 177 people got four acres. And this was in my father's deed. Uh, and then ultimately, the, the Connecticut River. The Connecticut River Changed the course. wiped it out. Yeah. You know, uh, and in about 1800, the lots were washed away by erosion. So that found it kind of interesting. So it kind of ties into that, too. And so, it was valuable land yes. for growing crops at the time, yeah. as we know but, the whole river yeah. value here is. We're Next about step. to leave the opening history and move on to another section, but I'm wondering if anybody else, thank you, Ted, exactly. Uh, anybody else has either a question or some input from all this to this point? You good for now? Okay. Uh, just very quickly, I'm going to jump, um, Lisa, over to the houses that were built, and then I want to come back to ferries and bridges, which I think Ted knows about, too. But uh, we, have the, we have three squares. Mm -hmm. And one of them was the porterhouse, which is down here on the 
Um, that's Captain John Lyman House. Yep, we talked about that. And there's the Porter House over here, 1713. Captain John Lyman House, 1744. And of course, the Porter Phelps Huntington House. This is the Samuel Porter House. Right, so, so he was go ahead. He was the ancestor to the Porter Phelps Huntington House. So Porters were some of the early settlers, and that is, as far as we know, the oldest house still in Hadley. It's most recently we know it as the McQuesten House, but of course after Ted passed, it was has been sold. Uh, it's a beautiful house with that beautiful doorway uh, that was copied on the Farm Museum purposefully. And Mr. Porter was a very rich merchant. He had a store. He had a school that his daughter ran next door. Mm -hmm. And um, very significant to all the politics in Hadley, served as a selectman and in many other capacities as a deacon of the church. And then it was, I believe his, well, I'm not going to say, a descendant of his who built that first house outside the Palisades, being the Porter Phelps Huntington House, which is also known as 40 Acres. And there were many, or several different books have been written on 40 Acres. And we're hoping that that's a future program here too, that they can talk about their own history because it's significant. It's called Porter Phelps Huntington because Moses Porter, the original, um, died in the Revolutionary War, the only person in Hadley known to have passed because of the war, and the house went to his daughter, and then it went to her daughter. So the first daughter was married to Phelps, and the next to Huntington, and then the Huntingtons turned it over to be a museum. And it's, that's a wonderful museum if you have the chance any, ever to go up there. Those were the earliest residential homes we could find, you know, built that were, they were here. represented they here. were represented here on the quilt. Yep. The one thing um, Jane and I were checking out, and Lisa, I don't know if you know anything, the blacksmith shop seems an enigma to me. I haven't oh, been able to find anything. The blacksmith anything. shop was like. Which is right here on the bottom. Uber important. That stood near the corner of Bay Road and Middle Street. And Brenda Tudrin did that one because she said that's where she grew up. And the blacksmith's name was Phineas Moriarty, known as Finney at one point. Blacksmith shops were uber important in terms of making hardware and all the things you needed for wheels and barrel rings and Toys. anything you can think of in terms of hardware for whether it's a wagon or in your house, right? Hinges and handles and et cetera. And it was also the place, other than the taverns, where the gentlemen hung out to have a chat. And they hung out there all the time, apparently, and chatted up the town news. Do you think that was one of the early buildings, like you need the corn mill and you certainly need yes, a tavern? Yes, for sure. And the, again, there's a wonderful representation of a blacksmith shop at Sturbridge Village and other historic villages because it was so important to everybody's well-being. But it's gone, right? It's you gone in Hadley. It's gone in Hadley. Yeah. There is a little building at the house where the Aquadros lived that has like a forge thing in it. Okay. It was another little blacksmith shop. I want to talk a little bit now about the ferries and bridges that uh, Connecticut being our commercial byway here, we obviously had to get back and forth from the east side to the west side, right? Right. And there are a couple of squares, I'll show you and then we can talk more about them. But um, the old Hockenham Ferry I have from 1868 and that is right there. Yep in there and the Hockenham Covered Bridge, which is down here in the corner. And I'd like to turn this over to, I think, Ted and Lisa to talk what I know is 1661, south end of West Street, there was a ferry, 1692, at the north end of West Street, a ferry, 1868 was the old Hockenham Ferry, and that there were five bridges built across the Connecticut that served Hadley. Ted, can you help okay, us with I'll this touch topic? On the, uh, if you know or have seen on Bay Road, the end of West Street, Bay Road, Aquavita Road, just put it, is there's a, mon a little monument that says Old Ferry Landing. Well, just as an aside, uh, our family now, we own all, when you come down Aqua, you own all the land to the left. And they tell you that because it gets interesting. Uh, the uh, 
the ferry landing, uh, and I, I'll read it here if you, if, just for a second. It says, crossing the river always posed a problem. For years, the answer was to run ferries. The first ferry ran from the south gate of the Palisades on West Street in Hadley to the Northampton Meadows. Joseph Kellogg was the ferryman in 1677. This was known as the Lower Ferry and was run by the same family for over 100 years. This ferry carried hundreds of sailor, soldiers across the river to be garrisoned in Hadley during the Indian uprisings. Today, an upright stone marks the spot where this ferry docked on the Hadley side. It is located on Bay Road near the southern end of West Street. And in, ta in, in taking that, is a re did some research and the they, uh, study was done and from where the, the river was at, at uh, Bay Road mm -hmm. and Aquavita Road. And, and in, right now, they did an estimate that the river is 0 0.03 miles from Bay Road. Now we own all we own all that land. I actually checked it like a month ago after this. It's now 0.50. It's almost a half a mile. So the Connecticut River has moved from Bay Road to you know where the Connecticut River is now. It's almost almost a half a mile. Wow. So it's really something. So awesome. the Northampton people lost. And Ted gave. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gave the meadow that yeah. you know. And we lost that four the acres north. on the north. And we gained, <laughs> and we've gained about uh, since. Uh, we've owned, well, I'm 83 years old, and the, uh, we've gained about 35 acres wow. since I, and it, we've, since his and that my father bought, and that, bought that from the town, and it was, it's called, San, it was called Sandy Beach, and next door was, at the time, was a public, uh, the town used to have dances and so forth, but that was underwater for, land yes, yeah, so. Good. Any more on the ferries or bridges you want to share with uh, us, Ted? I'll, I'll mention the covered bridge. Please do. If I could. Uh, are you familiar that there was a covered bridge? Uh, it's where Mitch's Marina was, just to put in perspective, no, no, no. Mitch's Marina? Yeah. Well, there was a covered bridge there. There's a picture in the book I have here. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I was uh, uh, about 13 years old, uh, just to put in perspective what happened. It did get burned down and, uh, by someone, and we, the rumor was, by myself, and some of us know who it was, but we're not sure, but someone Come burned on. it down, <laughs> un unfortunately. It wasn't me. Yeah, we <laughs> but, yeah. This and says it burned in 62. Right, in okay. All right. You could tell us. No, no. Oh, not who, uh, <laughs> but having said that is, when I was 13 years old, John Callahan, attorney John Callahan, and Joe Weinzick, we would ride our horses. Now, to tell you, Middle Street you know, stops at Bay Road, goes a little further, there's the, hand, the town garages, and so forth. Yeah. Well, back, at, back 70 years ago, Middle Street stopped and it became River Road. It was a dirt road. We rode our horses to the covered bridge. Right? And right now, that road is gone. It's in the middle of the Connecticut River. So. In 70 years, that's happened too. So, the, you know, we rode and it's now gone. So things change. And uh, but again, it's it's been interesting that uh, it doesn't exist anymore, and uh, we can't ride in it there anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> and after 60 years, you're still keeping a secret. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> Good. I really like that square because the lady that embroidered it. She put the year that the bridge was built and the year that it was burned. So you have the history right, oh, right there, so to speak. Don Blyda mm -hmm. is the name on it. Right. Anybody know Don Blyda or that family? All I ever knew was Blyda Ford over in Northampton. Mm -hmm. So it was built in 1840 and burned by some unknown perpetrator yeah, <laughs> in 1962. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate that. Anybody else got anything on ferries and bridges? We're doing very well. We have other squares that are just town buildings, which I'll point out, Lisa, if you have anything you want to add to it. We have the town hall of Hadley that was 
built in 18 and 41? 1840 or 41, yep. Right? And we have the Russell School, which you can still see. Down here, the Goodwin Memorial Library, and you told us about Goodwin a little bit early on. Yes, and one of his descendants left most of the money, and then there was a fundraiser to build that building in 1902. Okay. And now, of course, <laughs> that building is going to be repurposed. <laughs> Nature of life, huh? And the last one we have that is the current town building, I think, is the Hadley Fire Department. Well, we have a Hadley Fire Department, but it doesn't look like Not that, that anymore. <laughs> that looks That's like the one, the one that existed on West Street back in 1976. Yep. Now we have two beautiful modern facilities <clears throat> for fire departments. Yep. I, uh, we, we had talked about, but I'm not going to run through them, but there are several churches on here. Yes. We have, uh, of course, Holy Rosary, which has become Most, Most Holy, Holy Redeemer. Redeemer. And we have the St. John's Church. Which is V1 Vodka. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Repurposed. Repurposed. <laughs> for the other half of the population. And the First Congo, First Congregational, please excuse me. That's okay. And we've got another one. Across from that, there's this North Hadley Congregational oh, Church one. was originally called the Second Congregational Church when enough people had moved up to North Hadley in the 1840s to build their own church then. And then um, I think it was in the 1990s that they changed the name to North Hadley Congregational Church. And the other, uh, the blacksmith shop, and the other one I wondered about was the store and post office here, Lisa. Do you know anything on that one? The store and post office were where Dunkin' Donuts is, and people had to go and, of course, get their mail from their mailboxes for the most part. It belonged to Shipman family and the Gaylord family, and it has evolved into a bank and a Dunkin' Donuts, so to speak. <laughs> All this repurposed but it, stuff. Of course, it was the, you know, a real center of the we town. Grocery store here too. Yes, it was the grocery store, the general store. <laughs> okay, uh, I was fascinated and we had to do a little hunting. Jane and I were looking this up, but you knew it. What? On the two flowers, the Hadley Rose and the Hadley I was Tulip. Wondering about that. Well, <laughs> the tulip I didn't find much information on. There is a pretty picture of it in this book and it's an orangey color. Um, the rose though, I do know something about, and, and Hadley had a gardenia named too. There was a um, gentleman that cultivated gardenias, Mr. Morton. But the Montgomery Rose Gardens stood where Home Depot is now, and the Butler and Almond was across North Maple Street. And there were many, many greenhouses, most of you remember. And a lot of people can say they worked in the greenhouses, taking the thorns off the roses and helping to grow the roses. Miss says Sandy Elder was a Montgomery, lives in Amherst, and she told me her grandfather, who was Alexander Montgomery, went to Mass Aggie, which is now the University of Massachusetts, and he loved Hadley, he loved the Connecticut River Valley soil, and he was the man who started the Montgomery Rose greenhouses and Montgomery Rose business around 1910. Sadly, he died in 1927, but in that short amount of time, he established a, a big business of wholesale and retail flor, florist, um, roses specifically. He created many, <clears throat> many that could be reproduced and sold. The names I remember hearing about were Signet, Hadley, and Talisman. And she says that the um, Hadley rose was a dark reddish pink, big bloom, hybrid tea, which means it's a single blossom on a single stem. So that was cultivated way back in the early 1900s. Perhaps, we're not sure, to honor the 250th anniversary in 1909. The tulips were planted all over the place in 1976. The book says that there were 12,000 of them planted in town at that time. Wow. We have left out very few squares. Uh, we have uh, the Hopkins Academy Gymnasium. Is no longer there. It was a carriage house. It was made into a gymnasium. A lot of people enjoyed a lot of good ball games and, and PE classes there. 
And also up here, at least I don't know how I... Can I add, put in a little plug for that <laughs> barn? <laughs> Ted played a lot of basketball games in there. <laughs> Putting in the plug for the barn, Tom West, uh, and it was our uh, uh, classmate, teammate, and we, we played in that barn. We played every team. We, we had to shoot across uh, rods and so forth. <laughs> And in our two years, uh, we won 42 straight basketball games. Wow. And uh, it was stood for records for many, many, many years. And at the time, again, we're Hopkins. We had 11 boys in the senior class. And we, uh, our senior year, because we're undefeated, we won the small schools UMass championship. They, the selectmen had to get involved to get invited to the big tournament in Springfield. That's all the big teams from, you know, all over. Massachusetts, and we got we we got beat by one point in overtime by Worcester Commerce, who had 4,000 students. They won the tournament, they won the states, and they won the New England. So oh. that was uh, you know, everybody's talked about that, and we're we're quite proud of that. But so we played in that gym, and that's where we learned it all. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, I missed somehow in all of our talk about this, this uh, first panel here, Lisa, the water-powered mill in North Hadley. It's, Anything? It's still there, right on the, right beyond, below the dam in the North Hadley Pond. Okay. Um, Jeanette, that works in the East Hampton Bank, lives there with her husband, James, and they've remodeled it or refurbished it, and it's beautiful. Lovely. And it's no longer a mill, though. We can't say that anybody's <clears throat> grinding nobody's up grinding corn. corn huh? And uh, the last of maybe three, the, up on top of Skinner, the uh, Golden Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no, I'm not You're in trouble. That. You are corn. in trouble. Jay that showed me the clock, Lisa. Mount <laughs> Holyoke. It is not Mount Skinner. It is Skinner State Park. But Mr. Holyoke oh, named that mountain for himself. Um, along with his buddy who named Mount Tom for himself. And they're, <laughs> they did, they were walking up the, you know, through the hills, hunting and whatever. And uh, Tom Pynchon and Eliezer Holyoke Jr. And so the so one guy said, hey, that's my mountain, Mount Tom. And the other one said, well, fine, then that one's gonna be mine, Mount Holyoke. So it's been the case for many years. And I think we could have a whole program on the, on the mountain houses and how they've evolved. But it's Mount Holyoke. That's good. Mr. Skinner story. donated. Mr. Skinner donated all the land to be a state park, so he gets all that credit. You have to forgive me. I'm yeah, I know. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> she comes from Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> Mount Warner and uh, Golden Court, I think, are maybe the only two we've missed on right. there. My guess is that Golden Court or the American Legion are the newest buildings on there. Oh yes. And I'm intrigued that they included Golden Court. Me too. Because there are two significant Hadley buildings that aren't on there, in my mind, that were here in 1976 and were here for much longer than that. And in both of those buildings that I'm thinking of, people spent a lot of hours in their lives, if they were Hadley residents, Ted and Tom for sure spent a lot of hours in one of these buildings that I'm thinking of. It's not there anymore, though. Any guesses? Hooker School. Hooker yes, School. Yeah. And the other one that's not represented is North Hadley Hall, which was also a school originally, and I then a library and then the farm. Yeah. I went to that school. She went to that school. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure why Irene didn't include those, because obviously she planned this very carefully. She planned out exactly what, you know, represented Hadley's history the way she wanted it. My big guess is that Maybe she, she gave. didn't like school. <laughs> well, she's got Hopkins on yeah, here and Russell. Squares, My guess is that she gave those squares to somebody and they never finished them. Yes. And then she had to hurry up and put it together. What we didn't tell you about, this, will, this is how we'll finish, Jane. <laughs> After Irene and the ladies got it all put together, they entered it in a contest at the Eastern States Exposition, along with many towns all around that did this. If you Google Bicentennial Quilts, you'll find that whew, many towns around did it. You were probably... A bad town if you didn't, I don't know, I'm kidding. But, and Hadley won second place in a huge, uh, what I believe was stiff competition. So it's kind of cool to have this kind of documentation to go with an, an historical artifact. And nice that somebody thought to frame it, and it belongs on the wall over there, but I wanted to feature it for all of you. 
And Irene also made sure that we had the street in Hadley from 1854. So a general overview just below the map of Hadley. Any questions? That's uh, everything. Well, there's a lot of additions that could be made. So. <laughs> Lisa, anything else you want to make sure that we say? The Aqua Vita. Oh, Jean wants to mention the Aqua Vita. As a significant the, everybody had pizza all uh -huh. Oh, the Aquavita restaurant. Yeah. Yes, oh, that's memorable. Love the mural. And go on. Oh, Terry right. Smith, whose grandfather built that business, has some of the murals. Oh, does she? That she was able to remove from the walls. Yep. Anything else, friends? John, thank you as always. We will look forward to your edited job. Takes out the worst parts that I do. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a relief. Nobody told me that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say to you. He's a good editor, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. You have done a marvelous well, job. You're yeah, welcome. Like job. I said, it's the tip of the iceberg. We're hoping to have better and more programs. Hadley is well documented in many books. The Senior Center has a small collection. The library, of course, has a collection. And we'll see you hopefully, uh, John, uh, Jane, for DPW. January yep. 6th. January 6th. Many big uh, changes coming out there on Route 9, so maybe we'll learn a little something about that. But I really appreciate the group of you that came out. Thank you. Thank you.